automation or the artificial intelligence that's surely going to make some jobs redundant, but in the same time also put pressure on human beings to do better. I think from an anthropological point of view, man needs to have a purpose and work gives him purpose. So many people define themselves by their job that will this hole be able to be filled by just something we want to do? It's, it's definitely an identity crisis for a lot of people. A basic income for everyone could be a launching platform to help uh, people adapt. Great, well, welcome back. And um, let me welcome uh, Martin Ford, uh, author of The Rise of the Robots, a book which I highly recommend. Um, it was the winner of the uh, Financial Times McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award last year. In fact, the last time I interviewed Martin, he was the day after he had won it. So this is a little human test of whether he's as easy an interview subject without a large check in his hand uh, as he was last time. Can I just ask first, are there any robots in the audience today? <laughs> Not yet is probably how Martin would take that. Um, the, I'm going to ask Martin first just to briefly, because he will be better at this than I am, summarize uh, the thesis of the book, uh, and then we're going to discuss it for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then really going to allow lots of time for uh, your questions, of which I'm sure you'll have many after you've heard his stimulating views. Martin, could you just give us in a, the two-sentence elevator pitch here for, uh, for the book? Well, the basic thesis of the book is that technology is becoming far more capable. And of course, technology has always progressed over time, but now we're really seeing unprecedented progress in the sense that machines are, in a limited sense, beginning to think. They're taking on cognitive roles as well as simply displacing muscle power. And this capability is increasingly scaling across occupations, uh, industries, and, and really across many skill levels. So I think that what it pretends in the future is that Eventually, machines are going to displace a lot of workers um, and potentially you know, create unemployment or, or perhaps drive down wages, and it's going to be a real issue for us. So explain why this is different this time, because in every other transition from field to factory, from factory to office, from office worker to computerized, new jobs have been created which we haven't imagined when the first revolution happens. Why is this different? That's right. Um, the key insight is that machines are in a limited way beginning to think. They're taking on this cognitive capability which we haven't really seen before. Now, as Andrew said, there were a lot of transitions in the past. People moved from the farm to the factory and then later they moved to the service sector. But the, the key thing to note about that is that in all of those cases, most people were nonetheless doing things that were essentially routine and predictable. So you may have been doing routine work on a farm, you know, then you were standing on an assembly line by the 1950s in a factory, and today you might be at Walmart doing uh, routine work in a, in a retail environment, but it's still fundamentally routine and predictable. Uh, what we're seeing now, though, is that technology is increasingly going to consume all of that. You know, machines are, are getting to the point where anything that is routine and predictable um, can be automated, and that's, that's the, the future that we're headed toward. And some people will successfully transition into non-routine work or more creative work and so forth, but it seems very likely that our, our entire workforce is going to make that transition. So I do think that there are probably going to be a lot of people that are ultimately disenfranchised by this. So what's your solution for the, the disenfranchised group? I think that eventually we need you know, a radical restructuring, something along the lines of a guaranteed income is, is the, the thing that I've advocated. I think that um, eventually we're going to have to do something to, to address the problem of people simply not being able to find enough work to generate a meaningful income, either to support themselves or to participate in the economy as a consumer and help uh, you know, drive demand for, for capitalism, basically. So, I mean, essentially you're questioning how capitalism itself will evolve. That's right. In order to have a successful market economy, you've got to have consumers. You've got to have people who are capable of buying the products and services produced by the economy. Without that, you're going to obviously enter into a kind of a downward or deflationary spiral where businesses can't find enough customers. And 
I think as you look around the world today, you see in some places some evidence of that kind of scenario already. And certainly as this trend continues, uh, it's not going to be helpful in terms of getting back on the track toward uh, more robust growth. So I must say, when I read the book, and I got to the part about the guaranteed uh, minimum income, citizen's dividend, I think you call it as well, it, the, uh, I thought, well, if that is the solution, we really have a problem because it's going to be very difficult to persuade governments to buy into, literally, this uh, particular solution. But, of course, now it is being tested out, isn't it? And, and I think in Switzerland, not for reasons necessarily of automation, there's a vote, albeit one that probably won't succeed, coming up later this year. Are you seeing experiments and, and genuine thinking of moving towards these types of solutions? That's right. It's an idea that's definitely getting traction, and you are seeing some real some possibilities of some real large-scale experiments, perhaps here and also in Finland, uh, which I think is a fantastic thing because that's what we need. We need to try this and, and examine the data to have some, some meaningful experiments, and then based on that, we'll figure out how to do it because obviously this is something that's never been tried. Um, it is true that, especially in the United States, I mean, it's a staggering political challenge to ever have this. It's almost impossible to imagine it happening, but the paradox is that at the same time, I think it's, in a sense, inevitable. If this trend continues, they're really aren't too many other solutions on the table that, that will work. So I, I think that it's a place that we have to get to somehow, and so I'm, I'm very glad to see that it is getting some attention, and, and there are quite possibly going to be some real-world experiments done. And I, and I do expect that it's going to probably be initiated perhaps here in Europe, and, and that you know, later it will come to the United States. So, I mean, you've been traveling the world uh, on the back of the success of the book and promoting the book. I know you're off to South Korea after this. Have you come across anything that has made you think, hang on, maybe I was a little bit too pessimistic? Or alternatively, something that made you think, I just wasn't gloomy enough about the outlook? I, I think in general, things to, you know, seem to be tracking along the lines of, of what I pr proposed. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen anything that really contradicts this thesis so far, and there certainly have been developments that have been surprising them. The most recent thing that, that I think really caught a lot of attention was um, DeepMind's triumph at the game of Go, which you know, is really just a tremendous challenge that many people had expected would take another 10 years before a machine would be able to, to demonstrate um, proficiency at that game. And, and the key thing to understand about that is not just that this system was able to be the human player at this game, but that the system, in large measure, learned to play that game by itself. Um, which is really quite amazing. And so I think there's plenty of evidence, at least you know, from a technical standpoint that you can look at, that suggests that we really are you know, seeing, seeing dramatic um, progress toward, toward this goal. Now, I'm going to try out a few more optimistic scenarios before we depress everybody in the audience with the, with the outlook. But first, I just wanted to run past you this idea of the singularity, the point at which artificial intelligence becomes superior to human intelligence. I know you're, you, don't, you may believe that will happen, but you believe it's further off than some people who advocate that or forecast that believe. Is that right? Right. I'm a bit of a, an agnostic on the singularity. I mean, there are, certainly where I live in Silicon Valley, there are people that are very deeply involved in it, some people say with almost religious fervor. Uh, I think that it is possible, certainly, that we're eventually going to build a machine that can think like a person. I don't think that will happen for probably many decades. That would be my guess, but of course, that's, that's only a guess. Uh, and most of the people that I've talked to that are actually working in artificial intelligence, that's the sense I get, that they are fairly humble about where we are today and, and what it would really take to get to that point. Um, having said that, if it happens, then, uh, you know, to use Stephen Hawking's words, it could potentially be the biggest thing that's ever happened in history. I mean, there would now be another intelligent entity on the Earth that, that is not human, and that would be unprecedented. And um, most people believe that if that happens, then within a short while, that the machine would be super intelligent. In other words, it would be far smarter than any person. So if that happens, then you can say that all bets are off. For, for one thing, then, at that point, no one has a job. Um, and, but the impact on the job market may be the, the least of our worries at that point. I mean, you're... <laughs> yeah. OK. Your, your basic thesis, though, is that you don't need the singularity for these, a lot of these consequences right, on the job right. market we, to occur. That's even, right. Even we in the what, current state of uh, 
trajectory of evolution of machines. Right. The, the, what I'm focused on and what I've written about in the book is really the much nearer term trend, which is really just specialized technology that can do specialized things. And so we're not talking about machines that think holistically like people. We're talking about smart algorithms that can do specific tasks or robots that can do specific things. But the, the thing to realize is that most people do specialized things. I mean, that in a sense was Adam Smith's whole point about um, the division of labor and the fact that over time people specialize. And as people do specialize, um, in many cases, what they're doing becomes easier to automate. So there is an, a, an enormous amount of work out there that is you know, fundamentally routine, specialized, repetitive, and all of that is going to be susceptible to automation, perhaps, over the next couple of decades. So I've just reviewed a, a, another book, Only Humans Need Apply, in today's FT, uh, which is essentially um, arguing that we should be more optimistic. We can work with machines. Collaboration with robots and, and machines is the future. Uh, and perhaps more optimistically, or over-optimistically, that uh, companies and others should take responsibility for ensuring that there is still fulfilling human work. Do you think there's any even short-term likelihood of, uh, of this outcome? Well, I, you know, I think that that is true for some subset of, of the workforce. Um, basically, what's happening is that over time, machines or technology are transitioning from being complements to workers to becoming substitutes. And that's happening relative to more and more people. So that over time, um, less people are going to be able to effectively collaborate with the technology because they won't have the necessary skill sets or capabilities. And more people are going to be subject to substitution. So I mean, no one is saying that all the jobs are going to disappear. But I, to me, it seems unrealistic to expect that, that everyone is going to find a place collaborating with some increasingly futuristic technology. I mean, just to take one example, think of self-driving cars. I mean, driving vehicles in many countries is actually perhaps the most popular or, or common occupation. So when we have self-driving vehicles, those jobs are going to disappear in the millions. Um, is there going to be an opportunity for all those millions of people to somehow collaborate with technology and still find a space? I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of that. So I'm going to ask you in a second what your advice is to the leaders of tomorrow about this rather gloomy tomorrow, I should have asked at the beginning the uh, audience to vote on a particular proposition on this. Uh, are robots a threat to highly skilled jobs? And there are going to be four options uh, flashed up for you. Yes, we're already there. Yes, in a distant future. Probably not. And we will be safe. I've allowed Martin slightly to skew the vote here by giving his gloomy view, but it may have made you think uh, that the reverse is true. So um, I'll ask you to vote on that while we're just thinking about this issue of what the leaders of tomorrow should be doing to at least benefit or possibly avoid the worst impact of this automation. What, what's, what's your advice to the that particular well, generation. I, I mean, I think it's important to think about this on two levels. The first question is, what should you do as an individual to make sure that you yourself remain relevant and don't get automated away? And I, I think that that's not an easy question to answer, but in general, you want to be focusing on things that are more creative and, and certainly on things that are non-routine. The last thing you would want to do is make a big investment in educating yourself and acquiring skills for some some occupation that's fundamentally routine. An example of that might be a radiologist, a doctor that looks at x-rays and, and mammograms. That's a, a job that requires a tremendous amount of training for a person to do, and yet I think it's, it's probably an occupation that's going to be automated in the not-too-distant future. So it's really important to be focused on things that are creative, things that involve genuine, meaningful interaction with other people, um, and so forth. And, and of course, it's also important to be very flexible, you know, to have, I think, sort of a holistic education so that you're in a position to move to different areas as, as opportunities change. I don't th think there are any radiologists in the audience. I may be wrong, right. but there are definitely some potential lawyers. Well, how would you... Well, definitely, law, you know, law is an area that's being impacted. Uh, in the United States, there's already a tremendous shortage of jobs for lawyers. So, you know, they educated too many lawyers. We're beginning to see the impact of technology there, especially on, on entry-level type works. And so you've got a great many people who have spent enormous amounts of money to go to law school and now can't really find a, a job as a lawyer. So um, you're already seeing that you know, in some areas. So I, I would think carefully, unless it's really something that you're committed to, um, 
you know, and want, want to do. Um, I wouldn't do it just, just to have a job. Uh, but, you know, again, there, there are two parts to this. One is what should you do, and the second part of it, though, is, is I think being aware of what we need to do as a society, you know, you know an understanding that I, I do think that in the future at some point, this is going to require a political response, a policy response, and, and so it's really important to also be aware of that, I think, and, and incorporate that into your, your vision of the future. I hesitate to throw you the profession of journalist. Well, you know, journalists are, are certainly susceptible to this. There, there are already smart algorithms that tap into a data stream, and they can crank out an automated news story, and you can read that, and it's not obvious that it was written by a machine. Now, right now, it's more basic routine things. It's financial reporting about company earnings, and it's sports reporting and so forth. But the technology is rapidly getting better and better. And it, you know, it's not going to be just journalism. It's really going to be any kind of white-collar knowledge work, where you're, if you're sitting in front of a computer doing something fundamentally routine, you're writing the same kind of report again and again, you're doing the same basic analysis again and again. All of that is, is ultimately going to be susceptible to this. I foresee a future for myself as being the last conference moderator with the last human interaction on stage. Yes, it's Sink Gallon 2056. Um, so, please vote. We're going to open to uh, questions, so I can get a bit of light up in the, in the house. I'm sure there are lots of thoughts there. For those of you who haven't already gone off and decided to change your discipline of study or, uh, or choose, another, choose another role, let me see a few hands before I choose choose somebody. I can see... Well, let's start here on the left. Just see a hand in the shadows there. Could you say who you are and what your... If you yeah. dare, what discipline you're Hi. in? Hi. My name is Alejandra. I'm a biologist. A biologist? Yes. Okay. Um, how do you see... I, th I think you briefly mentioned basic income at the beginning of your talk. How do you see... And there's a nice boat coming next, next month here. How do you see this as relevant for those jobs that will be replaced, so to these people that will be replaced in the future? Well, I, I'm definitely glad to see that, that people in Switzerland are thinking seriously about this issue. I, I, you know, initially, this, this was not proposed because of automation, although I think that the proponents of, of the guaranteed income have recently sort of picked that up and they started talking about robots. Um, my sense is that it's very generous. I mean, I, what I propose in my book and, and what seems reasonable to me is that you would start out fairly minimally, maybe $1,000 or 1,000 euros per month, and, and your proposal here is much higher than that. And that's some cause for concern, because, of course, we still do need people to work. We're still far away from a completely automated society, so we, we do want to be careful that we don't create a strong disincentive to work. So I think it's a very positive development. It, from what I've heard, it, it seems unlikely to pass. Um, and I, I, my general feeling is that maybe a bit too generous as a place to start. There's a, a, another author called Richard Suskind who's written about the future of the professions in relation to uh, automation, uh, also with quite a radical view that they're going to be uh, um, automated away. And he says when he addresses an audience of professionals uh, and he reaches the point where he says, of course, there will still be room for a few very highly talented and creative professionals at the top of the profession. He sees everybody relax. Everybody thinks, oh, well, I'm the one who's going to survive and the next door person is toast. Um, lady here with a hand up in the fourth row, fifth row. And then perhaps the gentleman next to you. Unless you've got the same question, of course, conspiring. I was just raising my hand so we could get some attention here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, bait and switch now. I haven't, now I've seen everything. So, so, so you see, we, we don't need robots to have uh, smart strategies. You know? <laughs> we can. Um, so good afternoon. My question is, uh, so I'm, uh, my name is Charles, I come from France and I'm a diplomat, so I tend to work uh, about war, peace. So my question would be, which part of humanity is the most likely to use robots to eradicate or to enslave the other part? Right. Wow. We really well, are into dystopia yeah. now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that, I don't know the answer to that. There are certainly um, concerns about the use of robots in the military arena, about autonomous military robots that might, you know, kill people. Um, we do have this gravitation toward plutocracy, toward, toward um, extreme inequality. There are people that worry about 
a future that, that might be what we might call automated feudalism, where um, we have you know, an extraordinary group of wealthy people that sort of um, fence themselves off from the rest of humanity and perhaps you know, utilize technology to keep the rest of people out. I mean, that's a kind of a dystopian, futuristic scenario. There was a movie, Elysium, that, that sort of touched on that. So, I mean, that's a possibility. You know, I certainly hope that that's not where we're headed, but I do think that if we don't recognize what's happening and, and find a way to adapt to these trends to make sure that progress benefits everyone, then we are headed toward a far more unequal world. Do you think, in relation to that, that there is a moral responsibility that governments, corporations have in pursuing policies of automation uh, to prevent these things happening? Or are, are they standing in front of a tsunami unable to prevent? Well, I, I certainly think that governments have a moral role, and as a society, we have, we have a moral um, imperative to, to make sure that, that um, this doesn't get out of hand and, and create lots of social problems and also disenfranchise too many people. Now, when you talk about corporations, you have to understand that corporations operate in the market and there's a very powerful market incentive to automate jobs if you can and become more profitable. That's, that's inherent to capitalism. So I'm a bit skeptical when people say, you know, corporations should, should have a policy to deal with this. I don't think that, it, you know, to me, this is a bit what, what an economist might call a, a tragedy of the commons, where we've got this big problem, but the individual incentive for everyone that operates in the market is just to keep going and, and automate as much as possible. So I tend to think that it needs a systemic solution, and ultimately, I, I think that will have to come from government. Right. Okay, uh, yes, gentlemen, about halfway back. First one with a hand up there. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Alexander from Ukraine. Uh, I share the concern uh, about the threat of the robot, same as the audience, according to the results of the poll over there. Uh, and my question would be to, uh, to you as an expert, what uh, are the jobs which are highly to be protected or still done by the human in the distant future in the long run. My guess would be it's uh, some works of art, like uh, it is easy for a robot uh, to take a painting of Miro and dissect it in how many percent is green, blue, and uh, whatever other colors, but it's never gonna make uh, it's the same painting of Miro, but maybe you have some other ideas, thanks. Well, I, I mean, that's true. Genuine, you know, creativity, artistic type jobs for the foreseeable future are, are safe. Although, in my book, I do give examples of creative algorithms that are doing things like writing symphonies and, and painting original works of art. So you, you can't say that that's never going to happen. Um, you know, if, if you're asking what jobs are likely to be safe, say, over the next couple of decades, it's, it's things that involve genuine creativity. Um, it's many jobs that require sort of a combination of problem solving and mobility and dexterity. Skilled trade jobs, electricians, plumbers, um, jobs like nurses, you know, to build a robot that can do what a nurse does in terms of solving problems, interacting with patients, and having extraordinary levels of mobility and dexterity is still, you know, science fiction. That's, that's not something that's going to happen anytime soon. So those types of jobs are, are safe. Um, some of those are, are not very attractive jobs to people that want to go to university. You know, but very often people that get more education want to be knowledge workers. They want to sit in front of a computer manipulating information, and, and very often those kinds of jobs are going to be actually be easier to automate because you don't need a, a robot or a machine vision or anything like that. It's just an algorithm. The creative part does make me worry. I think we were talking about this yesterday. As everyone thinks they need to be more creative, we are going to be deluged with very bad art by human beings who think that they are getting ahead of the wave of robots. Um, OK, question. I could see somebody there just in the shadows on the, uh, on the right. Yeah. Hello, Jacob Tome. I work for Think Tank. Um, so, you know, we see robots are increasingly becoming like humans. You had the FT article a few days ago about this robot that manipulated its poll for a screenplay. I don't know if you saw that article yourself. Yeah. Um, I wonder why it's such a bad thing if we get rid of these repetitive, boring jobs and spend more time on being creative. Maybe we don't have to show everybody. Uh, could you perhaps show us the utopian vision of what you describe in your book? 
Uh, you know, if you had to tell, explain to us why this is a great thing and how this is going to make the world such a better place, what does that vision look like? Thank well, you. it's easy to imagine a very optimistic future. I mean, if you've ever watched Star Trek, for example, there's an example of a future where people don't have to work. They, they choose to explore space or, or do something for, for their personal fulfillment, but, but no one is digging ditches, you know, uh, on Star Trek. Um, so you can imagine a future where no one does a dangerous job or a boring job or a job that they dislike and, and technology does more and more of that. And I think that's a great you know, objective for us to strive for, but we need to adapt. And I think a, a guaranteed income is, is one really good way to sort of get on the path toward that. Because if we don't do that, then we run into the problem that even though jobs may not be desirable, they may be lousy, dangerous jobs, people need them in order to have an income. How do you set a, a guaranteed income that is sufficient to give people still an incentive to do something if they are able to? Right. I, I think that the best wisdom would probably be to, to start it minimally and, and hopefully do it fairly soon before this trend gets out of hand and then gradually increase it over time as, as automation you know, has, has a bigger impact on the workforce. So, you, you certainly don't start off by giving give everyone a, a luxury income that's going to allow them to just be a slacker and not work. I mean, the idea is that you give people an income floor, and then most people will choose to work on top of that. They may work part-time. They may start a business. They may do something entrepreneurial. And there's evidence to suggest that if you give people a basic safety net, that they will then be willing to take on more risk. So, for example, if right now you're stuck in a, a boring job where you're not growing, um, but you stay with that job just because you need the income. Now, if you knew that you would have access to a guaranteed income, you might be more willing to leave that job and do something more dynamic, more entrepreneurial. Um, so, you know, increasing the safety net can actually result potentially in a more dynamic, entrepreneurial economy. Before we lose the poll here, how would you have voted, Martin, on this one? Distant future? Or we're already there. I'm guessing you wouldn't have gone for well, weekly safe. You know, to, to, to some extent, we are already there. We're seeing an impact on, on jobs like, like law, like journalism, um, some areas of medicine. So, you know, it's, it's not a huge impact right now, but it, there definitely are examples out there that you can point to. And, um, I, you know, it's something that's going to progress over the next 10, 20 years. I don't know if you would say 10 years is the distant future. I, I wouldn't. I would say that's more medium term. Um, so it may be sooner than the distant future that we, we really do begin to see a very significant impact. Right. No need to keep mentioning journalism, by the way. I just brought that up to get it off the table. So, uh, yes, I'm here on, this, on the front row. Hi, I'm Yenja, and I'm a world memory champion. And my question is, do you have any sort of suggestion at the individual level how we can prevent this? Sorry, you're a world what champion? Memory champion. Memory champion. I will remember you, Mr. Hill. OK. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, is building memory strength a, a, a good strategy? I, I, I mean, there's, at the individual level, you can't prevent it. I mean, you can't prevent machines from taking jobs. You can, as, as I said before, you can, as an individual, try to adapt to it. You can you know, educate yourself very broadly so that you have the flexibility to move to perhaps a different career if, if, if uh, whatever you're doing right now is, is threatened by this. Um, and you can try to focus, as I said, on things that are more creative and so forth. So it's a question of, as an individual, what can you do to adapt to this? You certainly can't do anything to prevent it. Have we still got the mic down here? I'd just like to ask you a question. So, I mean, in the light of this, or possibly you already, what, what are you doing to see off the... What's your personal strategy for not being automated away? Well, my personal strategy is that I have an array of skills, but also the fact that I'm not circumventing to the fact... That I'm not giving up the fact that I want to learn different things from different aspects of the world, because so many kids today say they don't need basic arithmetic skills or basic knowledge about the world because... They can just look it up on their phones. But for true innovation and true original thought to occur, you need to have knowledge from different areas. OK, so that goes to the ad adaptability point, I guess. OK, we've got time for m a few more questions, I, I hope. Um, I haven't looked over. Is anyone over on this side? No. OK, we'll go here then. Somebody with their hand up. Looks about four rows from the aisle there. Um, hello, I'm Alexander from St. So. You say basic income could be a possibility. 
And I agree that when capital is pooled, you need to redistribute. But my question is, or my fear is, the boredom. Studies indicate that happiness correlates mostly with work. And if that really happens, that just some people, like in the ut utopia you showed, are not working um, and just exploring their life, I think they, they miss a big part. So this reminds me of the Roman Empire where you had slaves and the other peoples are just um, having a life and doing nothing. So are we going back to bread and circuses? Well, I mean, it's a good point. In, in the world today, jobs are kind of a package deal and they provide at least two important things. One is an income and the second thing, at least for most people, is that sense of accomplishment and fulfillment and something to occupy your time. So I think the reality is that in the future, we are going to have to find a way to decouple those two things so that you still get both of those two essential components, but you may not get them from the same place. Uh, so you may you know, get a guaranteed income, and you may also um, find fulfillment doing something that's productive, but you just won't be paid for it. And there are, there are examples you can point to. I mean, people spend huge amounts of time editing Wikipedia, or software developers do open source software. Obviously, you can volunteer in the community and so forth. So there, there are alternatives out there to offer that people offer people that sense of fulfillment and, and, and something productive to do without necessarily having that be their job that they derive their income from. OK, so it's getting more optimistic as we go on. This is, all, this is good. Uh, I, I'll take another one from near the back there. I don't know who's got the microphone, but perhaps somebody can choose. There were about three people on the, there we go. Okay. Hi, thank you. We were crowdsourcing the microphone. Um, <laughs> So this morning, I asked some government officials if they saw automation and artificial intelligence as a, th as a threat for employment in the future. And they basically said no. Uh, what is your impression of government awareness on this subject? Yeah, and do you see it as a threat? Well, in general, it's not there yet. I mean, this is, we're beginning to have a debate on this, a discussion about it. Um, there's certainly been a lot of attention to this issue in the media. I go around and give a lot of talks to groups like this. So people are very interested and wondering about it and concerned about it. But I would say, by and large, it hasn't really you know, you know, entered the, the political sphere yet. Um, and I, and I, perhaps we're just not at that phase yet. I think that the first thing is to, is to really build awareness of this and to begin to have a public discussion. And eventually, the politicians will take notice. But you know, it, it has to be said that there continues to be a lot of skepticism out there, not just on the part of politicians, but also many economists. I'm sure you could find a Nobel Prize winning economist who would tell you that this is all silly and this is not something we need to worry about. So this is, there's, this is we're not, not at the point where we have consensus on this yet, that's for sure. But um, obviously, I have an opinion, and, and I'm trying to get people to think about it. I mean, you're, you're, apart from wanting to sell the book, obviously, you, I mean, you are genuinely personally worried about this. As yeah, I, I, I mean, this is a concern. I, I personally think that this is going to be a huge challenge for us over the next couple of decades. So I, I, you know, I have a daughter that's eight years old, and I, I worry about what, what kind of a future she, you know, she's going to have in this world if we don't adapt to this. Are you already nudging her towards certain creative or other? <laughs> well, to some extent. But you know, to, to, you know, this is really so unpredictable, especially when you think out 20 or 30 years that it's almost, you know, pointless to, to, to really try to plan for it. I think that, you know, we're really headed toward potentially an extraordinary disruption and it's very, very hard to predict how things are going to come out. There's going to be this terrible moment when she's a teenager and she, sh she says she wants to be a journalist. <laughs> um, okay, I'll come back down to the front here. The gentleman here on the right hand, right hand side, if I may. We've got time for a couple more, so keep it brief, if you may. All you right, could. I will. Um, I think it's not really the rise of robots which, is, which should be seen as a threat. It's really the fact that we are not able to keep pace with the reskilling of people to be able to find other activities. So robots are not the problem. It's the humans which are the problem. Well, I mean, you, can, you know, that's, you can define it that way, but the basic reality is that you know, most people in the workforce are average, right? I mean, if you think in terms of capability of people, there's going to be a bell curve there. Most people are going to be close to average. So if the machines get to the point where they encroach on what those average people 
are capable of doing, then, then you run into a problem. So it's not just about, you know, that's the point I was making earlier. It's not the historical case where people have retrained from doing one routine thing in, in one industry to doing a routine thing in another industry. What, now we're talking about a different kind of transition where nearly all of the routine work is going to disappear. Um, and not everyone, I think, is going to be capable of transitioning into something that's genuinely non-routine or creative or whatever you want to call it. OK, I can get probably two more questions in if they're very brief and just, just questions. So you've already had one, I think. So we'll go to the person here on the, the robot with the, with the open collar. Just here. Yes, you, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Alek. I'm from Russia, and I'm building robots. And uh, which, okay. yeah, yeah. And which direction of robotics, to your opinion, are most perspective? Is it agricultural robotics or manufacturing or military? What do you think about it? Well, I, I, you know, this is the most important point about this is that this is a Just general... Just hang, hang on to the mic, because I may have a question for you in a second. Oh, okay. I, I think the most important insight about all of this is that this is a general purpose technology. So there isn't any one industry. I mean, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's agriculture, and it's manufacturing, and it's warehouses, and it's retail stores, and it's flipping hamburgers. And it's all kinds of knowledge-based jobs where it's just going to be algorithms and not robots at all. It's, it's, it's really everywhere. And that's what makes it different. If it were just one industry that were being impacted, then the solution would be simply to move everyone from that industry to, to other areas in the economy, right? But, but it's really, it's really going to be everywhere. Which type of robot are you building? Or did you come here to find out which, which direction to go with your robot? I'm building robots for city malls, expat centers, cinemas. They are anthropomorphic. You can find them in a, uh, for example, shopping mall, ask any question, where is the um, uh, food court, for example. He'll say, come on with me, I'll show you. We solved three biggest problems of robotics, is a speech recognition system, face recognition, and uh, our robots are very interesting. And if someone wants to buy, call me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Pitch over. I would say good luck, but the tone of this uh, discussion has been that we're going to be wiped out, so I won't necessarily give you all my luck. <laughs> one, one last question. Now, is this your question? OK, so the lady here. <laughs> no more bait and switch in row four here. Hi, my name is Dania from Libya. Uh, I work for Uber, and my question is, do you think that robots will affect um, the social dynamic that people have, given that now that robots, or when they start, when robots start uh, working, the whole professional interaction of people at work is going to isolate people. To some extent, I think that that's the case. I mean, you know, people will be interacting less, perhaps. I mean, I think that you know, there's a future where you may have fewer people working in environments because there will be more machines and and fewer people, so that will cut down on, on interaction. And also, we're going to have definitely a big social issue with people interacting directly with technology as though it were a person. And, and there are examples of that already. In China, there's a, a, a very popular chatbot that runs on mobile devices that, that people walk around telling their problems to already. And that's obviously the very, you know, at its infancy. Uh, but this is going to get much better, where, you know, you're, you're Technology is going to interact with you in, in a way that might be indistinguishable from another person, and that's going to have real social implications as well as economic. Most of my younger colleagues already wear headphones in our open plan office, so you don't need robots to have social isolation at work, I would say. Um, we haven't got time to take any more questions. Martin is around here if others want to uh, grab him briefly afterwards. Um, but uh, let me just say that I do hope to be coming back here still in 20 years and possibly will be hosted by more of our Russian friends' uh, robots when we arrive. Uh, but I think there is still a role for human interaction of this type in this kind of forum, and I hope there will be for years to come. Please thank Martin Ford. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thanks.